This is 360 Documentaries on ABC Radio National. Hi, Brent Clough here. Welcome to 360 Documentaries. The subject of disability and sexuality has been widely ignored by the media and society at large. Broadcaster John Blades has a significant disability and he'll be your guide on a journey through the uncharted waters of sexuality and the disabled. Fragments from John's own life story are sprinkled throughout the program. Here's The Too Hard Basket... And just a warning, the program does contain material of an adult nature. Hi, Kylie. Hey, how are you going? Good, nice how to see are you? you. Good, a bit cold. Nice but... to see you. Yeah. I've been tingling all over. <laughs> Unreal, that's good to hear. Thinking about seeing you and your magic touch. Oh, thank you. I feel good. Yeah. Mm, good. Hopefully better I feel, soon. I feel warm. <laughs> but about to get a lot warmer. I hope so. <laughs> I'm 49 years of age. Now I've been in a wheelchair for 16 years and a motorised wheelchair for 11 years. I've driven the wheelchair with my chin for seven years. 1982 was the biggest year of my life when five major things happened. I graduated from civil engineering at Sydney University. I began working as a structural engineer, I worked for 16 years in the design of buildings and bridges. I started working in radio on the community Sydney radio station to MBS FM. I currently co-present background noise on 2MBS FM, once a fortnight. Hi, Doug, it's John Blades. G'day, John Blades, g'day. Doug Anderson. So this is for your very kind write-ups about background noise in the Sydney Morning Herald. OK, let's go. OK. Background noise, interview and feature on the Australian, Melbourne-based, multidisciplinary. Good morning, you're tuned to background noise on 2MBS FM 102.5 megahertz. Good morning. Richard Fielding and myself, John Blades, return for another morning of sound adventures. Richard and I co-founded an experimental music group called The Loop Orchestra, also in 1982, which has been described as Australia's most enduring experimental music group. We've done over 40 live performances, had CDs released of our own and compilations in Australia and Europe and the end of last year, collaborative compilation released on a label in Beijing. And 1982 was really a very big year for another reason, in that I was diagnosed 
with multiple sclerosis. This is a shock to everybody who's diagnosed with the condition. Probably less so for me, because I'd lived with my mother, who'd had MS for 25 years. So I'd learned to live with it and I'd seen the way it developed in her. Hers was only of a very mild, never needed walking sticks or a wheelchair or anything. Now we're placing the sling above this um, slice sheet for John so that we can place him into the commode chair for the shower, ready for the shower. The Home Care Service of New South Wales services me with all my personal care needs. Part of this is that each morning, two workers, like Tommy and Connie, get me out of bed, shower me, change me, transfer me to my wheelchair, and feed me breakfast. Home care provides me with independence to live at home and pursue my many and varied activities. My attitude towards MS has always been to put the MS on the back burner and get on with my life. I guess the more it progressed, the stronger became my determination to live life to the fullest. Kylie, as a way of introduction, would you please talk about the really very important work you do with people with disabilities? Well, I've been a sex worker for about 15 years now, and over time I started seeing more and more clients who presented with disability. So it's just kind of evolved over the years, and... I really enjoy seeing all of my clients, including clients with disability. I offer a range of services to all my clients, and my main aim is to be able to put a smile on their face. The skin is the largest organ of the body, and people ignore that. And I think that everyone deserves the right to be touched and to be caressed and to feel good about themselves. The important thing with my clients is that I don't necessarily ask what their disability is, but what their mobility issues or range is and, and how I can best accommodate their needs during our, our session together. Speaking personally, when you first came to me, for instance, you asked very sensitively if there was anything you should know about me such as areas of pain or spasming. And every disability has a different set of constraints and requirements. Mm -hmm. Oh, definitely. G'day, John. Good afternoon, Gary. How are you? Good. That's in good. For, I'm in for another session. Dr Gary Fulcher is a clinical psychologist with Multiple Sclerosis Society in New South Wales and Victoria. Thank you, Gary, for agreeing to speak to me. It's a real pleasure, John. Gary, would you please talk about your road in more ways than one to becoming disabled and the nature of your disability? I have a number of disabilities, I guess, the mildest one is that I have insulin-dependent diabetes. And in 1996, I was driving from one work site to another, had a hypoglycemic or low blood sugar episode, pulled over to the side of the road to get jelly beans out of the glove box, but passed out into what's called a diabetic coma before I actually 
got to the jelly beans. Through various circumstances, a fire started under the car. The engine was still running, got sucked into the cabin of the car, and then once inside, it just took off with some fury. And um, I woke up out of my diabetic coma uh, on fire. I spent six months in Concord Hospital Burns Unit, had multiple uh, graft, skin graft surgeries because I was had third degree burns to about 60% of my body and lost all of my fingers on both hands. On my right hand, I have a very small remains of my thumb and my index finger, my first finger, so I can grip with that and that allows me to be able to pretty much live independently. Yes, indeedy. So should we do chips anyway? Yeah, my word. Yeah, I'll, I'll give that a clean. Yep. Is this clean? Oh. One of my biggest losses is my ability to be able to hold my wife's face and to be able to, to have the sensation of uh, feeling her face. And, in fact, all the grafted skin on my body covers areas which were burnt down to the bed, like all the skin was burnt away so that there are no nerve endings there. So touch for me is now very different. But I also have areas of the body where I don't have burned skin where, where touch is quite usual. And on the non-burnt skin, being touched, being caressed, being massaged, being held is very important because of just the the nice sensation. But touch on the grafted areas, on those not particularly attractive areas, is also very important because it actually says you're still okay, I still love you, I'm still connected to you, even though this isn't, you know, the way you should be, I guess. Touch affects us, I think, it can affect us right to the core of our being. You know, when you open yourself up to feeling someone else pleasuring you, it's a very vulnerable moment. I think that the work we do touches upon lots of vulnerabilities that people hold, um, vulnerabilities around their sexuality, um, their ability to relate with others. So thank you for agreeing to speak to me. And as a way of introduction, would you please talk about the very important work you do with people with disabilities? Thanks, John. I came into doing sex work from a massage background, so I already had a really good understanding of the therapeutic benefits of touch, you know, from the work I'd done with, um, with massage clients. Um, and I've certainly brought that into my work in sex industry so I come from a nurturing place a place where people come to receive touch for pleasure which bolsters not just their physical systems through the benefits that you get from massage but also psychologically you know the sense of closeness to another person you know to sharing your sexual interests and desires and to play you know it, it is an intimacy that I think really strengthens people's self-esteem which can often be negatively affected by people with disability. You know, the chance to interact with someone who's not judging you, I think, brings its own benefits. Prior to my being burned, um, I had a very healthy sex life. After being burned, I was almost frightened by the whole prospect of sexuality 
mainly because I found thought of myself as being so repulsive, I guess. And it was my wife who initiated our first sexual encounter. And she often talks about that as managing our, our first sexual encounter. And I think that's very accurate. She was very aware of how sensitive and embarrassed and kind of lacking self-confidence that I was. And that was an enormous breakthrough because we actually had sex. It was just such a fantastic breakthrough and, and reconnection of, of, at, at an intimate level. In my case, the MS hasn't damaged the nerves on my skin. Sensation is normal. If you prick my fingers or feet with a pin, I can feel it for sure. The, the holding hands and the slow touch is just as important as, you know, intercourse. And for a lot of people, you know, the actual penetrative sex is, you know, such a small element of what we provide. And for some people, it's got nothing to do with it. I have some clients where the, they can't feel from below the nipples. So they may get erect, but they can't feel anything. They like to watch and they're incredibly sensitive from the nipples up. And so you can have two hours where you are touching someone and rubbing your smooth skin up against theirs or uh, using my long hair and just gently tickling them and it's it's slow and it's sensual and it's got nothing to do with penetrative sex but it's some of the most sexy erotic experiences that you can have and it makes it a much more pleasant journey i think when you're not striving always just to have an orgasm i think that can be very distracting from from the, the journey of pleasure of interacting with someone else. My close friends, like Duke and Justine, provide me with great support in my life. And would you like some beans? That's a scallop. I'd like to try one of these. But I'm going to go. I want to go and see the current exhibition at Gallon Park Outside Art Gallery. Oh, yeah. French outside artist called Jared Sendry. I've always had a very rich cultural life embracing live experimental music, film and art exhibitions. The most meaningful art for me is outsider art done by untrained people with very raw visions. The work is intuitive, completely free and spiritual. It's been very important for me throughout my MS journey to never regard myself as sick. The word sick is a straitjacket. You forgot to blow your nose today. I can't believe it. <laughs> do you still need to blow it? I do. <laughs> no, we're out of time. Sorry, Jim. Out of time, no time go. for a nose blow. Getting someone to blow your nose for you, it seems like a small thing, but it's actually symbolic of what you're giving up, the independence that you're losing. I'd love to be able to brush my own teeth and blow my own nose, but I have these lovely carers that do it for me. <laughs> Uh, it's a real bonding experience. Yeah. 
eight years ago, I was suffering what 70% of people in their mess suffer, which is depression. I'd fallen into a hole of depression because I was really at the point where I wondered what could possibly happen next with the body, with the legs, the arms going, new people who'd lost their speech, their swallowing, their eyesight, their neck movements. I thought, my gosh, if any of this happens to me, it would really be the end. And I didn't want any of that to happen. So I spent time actually during the day, a number of days, I, I don't know how many weeks this went on for, but I, was, I would actually stare into space, think seriously about the ways of killing myself, of ending it all because it seemed the only way out. A wonderful neurologist I picked up at that time that I'd known from years before was the first one to be able to see that I was worried about my future and asked me if I'd ever thought about killing myself. In MS, the suicide rate amongst people with MS is eight to 10 times greater than in the general population. And so I often work with people who are very depressed and uh, sometimes suicidal. Interestingly, in the discussions with those people, almost invariably, there is a discussion about sexuality there is a discussion about loss of intimacy, not necessarily with their romantic partner, but with other people, friends, family, um, the fact that people now don't touch them um, or they touch them in different ways uh, and so forth. And this, of course, adds into that depression, that self-image, the sense of self-worth and value. Seven years ago, my discovery of voice-activated computer and the internet opened a whole world to me and helped pull me out of the hole of depression. I'm just feeding John his meds, his medication and um, vitamins and stuff. And In 2001, I read a book called Taking Control of Multiple Sclerosis by Professor George Jelinek. This was a revelation for me and a clear way forward. In the book he showed that a low-fat diet and natural vitamins and supplements would arrest the progress of the MS. My MS immediately stopped progressing. Favourite flax seed oil? Tastes mm. beautiful. Mm. Yeah. It's what you call really taking control of multiple sclerosis. I've regained little bits of movement in my arms and fingers. Hard as you can. Go, 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 squeeze, 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 squeeze. And relax. Good one, John. Peter Sharp is my physiotherapist. Okay, now let's see what you can do with your thumb. Trying this to bend. Very fine movements. Trying to just bend the thumb down. And relax. Just, I've, I've never seen that much movement of that thumb. It's incredible. <laughs> About three years ago, with Kylie, we discovered together sexual reawakening when my erection and ejaculation returned 
after having been in the wilderness for 23 years. It's very rare for someone with MS who's lost sexual function for such a long time to regain it. was such a huge relief to me. Felt like a great weight had been lifted almost like a cloud had been lifted. And made me feel better about myself, improved my self-image, more relaxed with myself. Last three years, I just felt like a different person. And I felt normal again, completely normal again. My taxi driver, Ali, is really my road to independence in more ways than one. I put the strap around his chair first to remove the head supporter from the back of his chair. And then I put the bed in the side, crossing on the back of his chair. The supporting is not moving when I'm traveling with him. I've done it for many years, I'm very fast. <laughs> I like my job, I love my people to work with them, and people, I don't know, maybe they like me, and they listen to me what I say. <laughs> people have a, I guess, natural aversion, some people, to people with disabilities. Like, I know I've been out in public and I've needed a hand with something and I've called out, excuse me, very often people just ignore you. Several years ago, I'd gone out to cinema in, in the middle of the city of Sydney. And in my motorised wheelchair, with the chin control, on my own, I often go to films on my own. And I always feel quite pleased with myself when I go on my own to a film and I feel like it's an achievement to be able to do all this with no movement below the neck. I had the wheelchair backed against the building on the main street, George Street in Sydney, on a wide pavement, six o'clock at night, people absolutely everywhere, lots of people passing by, Lots of attractive girls, which I noticed. But I noticed one particularly. I can still see her to this day. Needless to say, I'm still looking for her. Beautiful girl in a beautiful red dress. Blonde girl. She was standing at the traffic lights, talking to somebody, and I, of course, was looking quite fixedly at her. Don't know whether she saw me looking, but anyway, I saw her rummaging in her bag. I must have turned my head for a split second because I was looking at her a lot, almost hypnotised. 
And in that instant, she rushed over to me, left three dollars on my tray, raced off across George Street. No word, no nothing, no chance for me even to explain. I'm all right, so I'm not, I'm not looking for money. She'd gone. And yeah, I think I would have preferred one of two things, kiss on the cheek, or if she'd offered to buy me a drink. I've also worked with people with acquired brain injury, people who are amputees, people with hearing impairments, HIV positive people, people with HIV positive related dementia, um, people with cerebral palsy, intellectual disability, Parkinson's disease. Also worked with clients with significant scarring due to multiple operations and burns. And also clients who during the course of our ongoing relationship have had a stroke and seeing the difference that's had on their sexual capacities as well. Hello. Hello, Kylie. Yes. It's Bruce. Hello. I'm nearly at your place. You're nearly here. Yes, yeah, I'm literally at your front door. Oh, right. So you'll come round to the back, won't you? Yes. Okay. See you in a sec. See you soon. Bye. Okay, bye. She's on her way. The person who's most important in my life it's my wonderful brother, Bruce, whom I live with. It's my principal carer, works five days a week. One of the army of unsung carer heroes. I tried calling before, but um, it was ringing out, so... Yeah, you oh. use the computer phone. Oh. Normally the hand phone you use, isn't it? But oh, oh gee, I did the last one that, I just, that got yeah. dialed, sorry. That's all right. Go through. Come on through. Okay. When I speak at different, say, at a university or at a conference, you know, sometimes I ask people and say, well, in the last week, who he cuddled up to someone or who he had sex or who he masturbated? And, you know, the brave people put up their hands and I say, you know, and who here in the next week will be doing any of those things or you think you would like to? And then I say to them, well, imagine if you had to tell three other people, including, say, your mother, that you were going to do that and you needed their assistance to be able to do that. And people are like, oh, no way. I'm like, well, put yourself in other people's shoes because that's what some people have to do. And it's wonderful that the parents that I have met through my interactions with my clients have been fantastic and they've had to bite the bullet and they know that they're children who are grown children now, they're grown adults, are having sexual interactions with me. And sometimes in, in the other part of the house. <laughs> they make a cup of tea, they leave us alone, and then it's all quite fine. And it's wonderful that they are able to do that. And I hope that the rest of society can catch up soon. I know people who, who are quite fortunate whose mums actually support them going to see sex workers and will sit in the in the waiting rooms of brothels waiting for their their son or daughter to finish an appointment. Thank you, Caitlin, for agreeing to speak to me today. Not a problem at all. Would you please talk about the nature of your disability and how long you've lived with it. I've had my disability cerebral palsy all my life, um, so it's just the way it is. I'm 31 years old and like everybody else, when I was a teenager, I wanted to know the issue of sexuality and body image it came up for me like it does everybody else. I walk with crutches. My first sexual experience was actually with a sex worker, um, a male sex worker, because I'm a straight female. But I wanted to know whether sex was possible for me, but I wanted someone good at it so I could gauge what 
was possible for me and whether or not I had to do things differently in order to achieve a full, you know, a full sexual life. I think really, and you'd probably agree, there must be many people with disabilities who are denied sexual expression due to a lack of information and or opportunities. I consider myself really fortunate to have the parents that I do because I can tell you when you go up to your dad and say, you know, I want to see a sex worker to see if it works for me and whether it's possible because I had able-bodied siblings and relationships were possible for them. You know, I was concerned about doing it, but it was a journey for them and it was a journey for me and it was hard to find a male straight sex worker. (laughs) It took quite some time. Kylie, I'm going to return to something about the experience of clients with disabilities that you've seen when it's been their first experience Mm. of sexual freedom, if you like. Mm. It's been a great honour to be able to sometimes be the first person that has ever been able to really touch someone or caress someone or hold someone in a way that doesn't involve you know, washing or bathing or taking someone's temperature or undressing or dressing them. All those things are mechanical acts where you're physically touching their body, but it's not looking at the person as a whole. And my role to be there is to be able to see someone as a whole being. And it's their time and it's it's about making them feel good. And there's a great process of finally they're getting to explore something and and a bit of sadness that it's taken so long for them to get there. People with disabilities have more difficulty in forming so-called normal relationships. A friend of mine a number of years ago said to me, John, if you started a relationship with someone, they'd be taking on a lot. I'll never forget those words. Since my disability became more visible 20 years ago, I haven't had a relationship. It's really funny because I can sit in a bar and people will talk to me and when I'm sitting down, people can't tell that I have a disability. And then when I go to the toilet, because I walk with crutches, they'll see the crutches and they'll either run in the opposite direction or they'll they'll think that they need to care for me. So it's this whole thing that you either get people that are really scared or apprehensive about being connected or attached to somebody who has a disability or you get people who want to care and look after you and I don't want to be seen as needy and people with disability don't want to be seen as needy. It's really funny because the person that I'm seeing at the moment I met out in the pub and I said to him I'm not needy and I'm not desperate I just have a disability. And he laughed at me and went, why did you say that before I even opened up my mouth and said hello? And I said, because people either think I'm really needy or really desperate because I have a disability and I'm neither of those. And we've been going out now for six months and it's going really, really well. Now, can you do my buttons, please? Yeah, sure. What's in there? <laughs> no, nope, there's nothing in there. Do you want? Do you want me to undo these? Ah, they're fine. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And I know you've made a great study of the role of carers, but carers sometimes are the sexual partner. And what's your perspective on? 
how much of a strain that can put on the sexual relationship. Yeah, that's a fantastic question, John, because society tends to think automatically that your intimate partner, your romantic partner, will be your carer, and I think that's very unfair, um, and I think it's socially irresponsible. As the needs of people with disabilities increase, the role of their partner, their sexual partner, their romantic partner, changes to a functional role. So rather than being a romantic, intimate role 100% of the time, it starts to shift into romantic and intimate part of the time and functional caring another part of the time. And as that shift moves more and more towards the functional care, the carer needs actually to disconnect emotionally from the person that they're caring for, their, their intimate romantic partner. And the intimate connection can die. For some reason, society seems to think that if you're born disabled or you become disabled, all of a sudden, all your sexual needs disappear. No sex life. My first client was in a wheelchair and when the booking was made, no one had informed me that my client was a paraplegic. And when I arrived at the door, um, I was very surprised and I wasn't quite sure how to handle the situation. I think at that point, I don't know that I'd even had a conversation with someone who was in a wheelchair because back in the early 1990s, there wasn't very good accessibility around. So lots of people in wheelchairs, you just really didn't see very often. But he was a great teacher for me and he taught me lots of things like that. He had a varied sexual appetite. It happened that his wife was overseas and his girlfriend was out of town and that's why he had hired me to come along. So, you know, um, it was quite an eye-opener to the diverse sexuality of people with disability just with the first client. So, would you tell me about the voluntary organisation Touching Base? Touching Base began in late 2000. People with disability were wanting to get access to sex workers who weren't going to treat them with prejudicial attitudes and sex workers were looking for training. We have a referral list of sex workers who have done our training or who are experienced or willing to work with clients with disabilities. That's a very important part of our work, helping people to connect. There are also important occupational health and safety aspects like um, how to work with condoms and catheters if people have a catheter, or how to help a client fall safely. So there's a whole range of different aspects that we cover. It's timely, you know. I think that as society matures, and I think we are in a maturing society, um, it has the capacity to deal with things that were before in the too hard basket, and hopefully that's what touching base is doing. We're dealing with a lot of the issues that people have felt previously were too hard. And as a friend of mine said, why should you be deprived of sexual experiences just because you're disabled? Sex sells everything, but when you're actually selling sexual services or people are wanting sexual services, then suddenly it becomes the too hard basket. There are a couple of countries who have really recognised the, the rights and the supportive nature of the government towards people with disability. Every local council area in Denmark, except Copenhagen, are provided monetary assistance for people with disability once a month to go and see a sex worker. I remember one of my clients who I saw 
who had significant disabilities, including um, he couldn't speak. We used a form of sign language to communicate. It was also a really important opportunity for this client to explore their sexuality because their only previous sexual encounter had been with a carer who had raped them to the point where they had been hospitalised for the damage and required surgery to recover from this abuse. So working with this client was a real opportunity to help someone to rewrite the past. This was their opportunity to explore what they wanted to explore, where they had the control. And that was really quite a magical session. Caitlin, do you know of any other disabled women who've used sex workers? No, I don't personally, but I can imagine it's a really hard thing to do, particularly if you're a straight female, okay? And finding a female sex worker who would be willing to see a female as well would be difficult. Women are still afraid to pursue the idea and to look at it. They sort of press it down and think it's not really an issue. We're supposed to be nice and well behaved and polite and genteel. That's not an issue we're not supposed to explore. And it also gives you a great feeling of being normal. It does. Sex is one of the biggest equalizers. The old umbrella man. I had a woman come up to me and go, um, dear, you know, in the street, and she asked me what my disability was, and I don't often talk about my disability to people I don't know, but she goes, because I have a grandson who is about your age, and, you know, he um, would like to pursue, you know, a relationship Have you got a relationship? How do you do it? And I thought she was trying to hook us up, so that was really funny. But then we moved beyond that, and she goes, I want him to see somebody really, really good at what they do and how they see themselves and how they see um, people, because my grandson is quite impaired and, um, you know, he's not attractive because his body is quite bent and it looks difficult. And she's telling me this and I'm going, do you mean, do you want your grandson to see a sex worker? And she's gone, is that what they're called? And so we went into this whole conversation mm. and I said, look, you know, there are sex workers who would be willing to see your son, grandson. And I actually told her about touching base and she found a sex worker that was suitable for her grandson and she rang me back and she said, my grandson said thank you to me. And this woman was 80. So, you know, I realised that, you know, people can be as open-minded as they want to be. Gary, why do you think the subject of disability and sexuality has been ignored for so long by society, media and organisations. I think society has enormous trouble being able to talk about sexuality. So you have two kind of shameful taboo areas, sexuality and disability. And so when you have, you try to combine sexuality and disability, again, as you said earlier, double barrier. Um, and if you throw homosexuality in there, well, you know, you, you just add to add to the mix. The triple barrier. Triple barrier. In the United Nations Bill of uh, Human Rights, the issue of sexuality and the need to be able to express sexuality is quite clear and yet if you're disabled that is taken away that that right for sexual expression is eradicated by community and I would hope that able-bodied people 
can start to have a sense that it's important for them to help the person with disability to be able to express themselves sexually and to feel comfortable about that. When you're actually talking about people having sexual relations or sexual interactions, people get very prudish. And it's only in recent times that people with disability haven't been seen as asexual. Or the other myth is that they're, you know, sexual deviants. And people don't want to think about people with disability as sexual beings. And the people that we're talking about are adults, grown men and women, that have every right to be touched and caressed and have a smile on their face. And who are we to stop people from enjoying such basic things as what you and I do? I essentially can't move anything below the neck. But there is certainly a lot of life to be lived from the neck up. The Too Hard Basket was made and conceived by John Blades. Technical production was by Timothy Nicastri, and the executive producer was Claudia Taranto. And on the 360 Documentaries website, you'll find lots of extra material related to the program to download or stream, including longer interviews with the people you've just heard, Dr Gary Fulcher, Kylie, Saul and Caitlin. There are also links to Touching Bass and other aspects of John Blade's life and a list of all the music used in the program, as well as the transcript. That's all at abc.net.au slash rn slash 360. And we'd love you to leave any comments you have about the program there on our website too. If you're starting to make plans for your summer holidays, you're probably wondering how you're going to fill all those empty days. Why not add some Radio National documentaries to your entertainment options? We've made it easy to choose which ones to download to your MP3 player on our site called Beach Pod. They're sorted into tantalising topics like mavericks and rat bags, landscape, writers and artists, or travel. There's something there for everyone's taste. Just look for the Beach Pod link on the Radio National homepage. And I hope you can join me next week on 360 Documentaries for a very different Christmas experience in Cuba, a place where Christmas has always sat oddly with the communist regime. There are plenty of conga lines and cues, and you'll meet Ioani Sanchez, who blogs about life in this paradise of contradictions. Last year, Time magazine called her one of the 100 most influential people in the world. I'm Brent Clough. Catch you then. And stay tuned to ABC Radio National for Poetica. Mm-hmm.